uh, by commenting on what Abe read for us, he mentioned a character that we're going to spend a good bit of time studying tonight. That was uh, Abraham. And uh, last week, I worked on a lesson at Second Street entitled, uh, What a Way to Live. But tonight, I'd like to share with you uh, a lesson that I've entitled, What a Way to Go. And no, it's not a morbid topic, Patty. You can you can quit looking like that back there. Um, and so really, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me, we'll, we'll begin with Hebrews chapter 9. Now, I think this should be in the forefront of our minds, what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And like I say, it's not a morbid topic. It's not something that we should shy away from. As Christians... If anything, we should embrace the end that will bring us over the river, if you will, into eternity. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the Hebrew writer words it this way. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that, the judgment. And so we realize that all of us have a beginning. As Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is a time to be born and a time to die. And so all of us have a birthday and all of us will have a death day. And so we need to recognize that in our lives. And as we think about what the Hebrew writer reminds us of and that, that there is a time appointed for us to die, consider your life with me for a moment. Our lives are like the seasons. The seasons of the year are constantly changing. And yet sometimes there is a subtlety in that change so that we hardly notice it until one day we wake up and it's no longer summer. It seems like it's turned into fall or, or winter. And um, so maybe it'll come on. Sometimes our lives can be that way we can become calmly complacent. And the seasons of our lives come, and then one day we wake up and realize that life has changed. And that complacency is, is a danger. Now, I want to warn you about that danger of complacency. There's danger in the comfort zone. When we become complacent to life with no real reason to live, then we are in a dangerous place. The question is not, will you go? The question is, how will you go? And you might wonder where I'm headed with this. But I've wondered, it, it, will my epitaph on my tombstone read? Or will my obituary notice in the newspaper read, died at age 45, buried at age 78? You know, oftentimes we forget how to live. I thought I'd do this lesson specifically for Mike, you know. I know he's feeling, feeling older every day. You know, but there are millions of people that die decades before they take their last breath. I've known Christians, members of the church, who have the attitude of, I've paid my dues, I'm done, I've been there all this time. I'm done. It's time for someone else to take over. Friends, our time's not up until the good Lord tells us it's up. And he'll make no mistake. There'll be no question. You won't have to ask, Lord, is my time up? You won't be able to draw a breath. Your time is up. You know, I remember, I remember a neighbor lady, Edna Franks, called my grandmother and she, she used to say from time to time, I don't know why the good Lord is keeping me here. And I've told you this story before, and I'll tell it again. I was, I was fairly young, probably 10 or 12 years old. And Edna Franks called up Grandma, and one day, and she was complaining. Grandma, Edna was 88 years old at the time. I don't remember my grandmother's age, but a good bit younger, but they called every day. And Grandma had just gone through cancer surgery, and so we were over there every day taking care of her. And Edna called one day, and she said, she said, Wyona, 
Sometimes I wonder why the Lord is keeping me here. Well, my grandmother's response, I think, was a perfect response. Well, Edna, maybe there's something you need to do yet. And went on and shared the gospel plan of salvation to her. And, and a week later, Edna called up again on her normal time and her normal normal phone conversation. She said, why don't I went and did it? Grandma goes, went and did what? She goes, I went and got baptized. And so there is something. Maybe it's not as big as it once was, but there is something for us to do with purpose. Oftentimes people simply stop living and what I've termed mummification sets in. You see it everywhere. Older people that, that just don't have the spark left in them. Now, I know there's some old folks around that's got a good bit of spark left in them. Dave over that comes around with the with the electric pointer at the kids all the time. There's a guy. Mummification ain't setting in. Old age is setting in. But Dave has spark. We call it spunk sometimes. But there's still life in that old body of his. My grandma Fagan used to have a, a, a sign in her kitchen that said, age is a state of mind. And I think that's true. Age is a state of mind. She also had a plaque that said, Grandmas are just antique little girls. I have to say, you, you, you ladies here kind of come to mind of that. You're just antique little girls. You know, your personalities still have that spark. There's still life. Keep that life. Keep that spark. It's the complacency and the mundane that drains the life out of us. We might find ourselves very well whining our way to the grave, having nothing left to live for. Uh, there was a, an elderly man at the nursing home when I was doing nursing home ministry out at, at Reno with Daniel Root. There's an elderly man there. He had been a Baptist preacher for years and years and years. And I remember his name and the guy the guy made a lasting impression on me. But and he, he came to Bible studies for quite some time and his name was Arbia, which is Hebrew for son of the king. And, and Arbia had you know, like I say, been a preacher, been a Baptist preacher for many years. But he had the attitude of, you know what? I've been to enough Bible studies. I've paid my dues. I don't need to go. And so, so that was kind of his attitude. We would see him in the lobby. He would greet us cordially. But after a spell, did not bother coming to Bible studies. And so I felt like, that mummification was setting in. The attitude of he'd been there long enough. So what's the Bible pattern? It seems like the Bible has a pattern and we could go many different directions with this. We could, we could talk about our spiritual well-being. We could talk about our physical well-being. But I want us to draw from, from the Bible a pattern. But before we get into that pattern, I want to do a little disclaimer. Don't think that physical wealth or physical things will bring you lasting happiness. It won't happen. We are going to talk about some physical things, aspects of life that, that the Bible teaches us in this pattern. But Ecclesiastes... Solomon is an old man now. Solomon was the richest man that ever lived and, and the wisest man that ever lived. But Solomon, as he's an old man, writes this book of Ecclesiastes. One of my favorite books in the Bible because he's, he's questioning the purpose of life. And in verse 3 of chapter 1, Solomon said, What profit hath a man of all his labor? which he hath taken under the sun. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. Drop down to verse 8. He says, All things are full of labor. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What well, Solomon says, I've chased everything. If you read this chapter, I encourage you, read the whole book of Ecclesiastes. But if you read this chapter, the first chapter, Solomon recognizes he's done all this stuff. If he wanted it, he got it. 
If, if he hadn't tried it, he tried it. And so he did all this searching for what brought him true satisfaction. And at the end of his book, it's not on, not on the slide, but if you go to the end of his book, he has a conclusion. Chapter 12 and in verse 10, he says, The preacher, as he refers to himself, sought to find out acceptable words, which was written, even words of truth. Drop down to verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Solomon summed up what brought him true, lasting satisfaction. True purpose of life. That it was to serve God. To keep God's commandments. Brought him lasting satisfaction. I want us tonight to look at Abraham. Moving on from Solomon into Abraham. If you look at Abraham's life, it's very interesting. And I know that we don't probably have anyone here that is all that close. There may be maybe one or two of you that might come close to the age of 75. But think about it. Abraham left his lifelong home at the age of 75. God appeared to him, said, Abraham, I want you to leave. He was in his hometown, Ur of the Chaldeans. He, his father was still living. He had a cozy life. Abraham did not appear, for what little we know of his early life, to be an adventurous man. But here in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4, God tells him, pack it up, Abraham, head out. I'm going to make of you a great nation. What's Abraham do? He obeys the voice of the Lord. Now that would take some challenges. Some of us would say, I'm too old. 75? I told Kate when we moved to the farm, I never wanted to move again. I said, I hope the next time that I move out of the house, it's feet first. Abraham's 75. I can't imagine it. You know, at the age of 86, he had his first child, was through an adulterous relationship with, with a servant because he and his wife, Sarah, were trying to bring about God's promise in a way in which God did not desire. You want to see more about adulterous relationships and what God instituted when he instituted marriage Check out Matthew chapter 19. The whole chapter deals with deals a lot with marriage relationship, divorce, remarriage. We're not going to look at that tonight for time's sake, but just, just bear in mind, Abraham was 86 years old when he had his first child. Now think about this. His child that God had promised him through the wife of his youth, Sarah, was born to Abraham when he was 100 years old. I, th I think I see a lot of guys in here that's got some life left in them yet. If Abraham can do it, what's wrong with us? Why are we, why are we kind of slowing down? You know, Abraham <coughs> believed God's promise, and God brought it about. I believe if my memory serves me correctly, Sarah was about 90 years old herself, about 10 years younger than Abraham. There's no, no whining away to the grave in Abraham's life. He's got a son to raise at the age of 100. You know, at the age of 137, his wife passed away. His wife Sarah died, and he buried her. He purchased a, a tomb, a plot of land, and he buried her. We see that. We can look at that in Genesis chapter 23, verse 19. Just gives us the Bible passage. Now, wouldn't you think at this age, wouldn't you think at 137 years old, it's time for the retirement home? I mean, there's, there's people a fraction of that age. We have a nursing home and care facilities now. Not Abraham. Uh-uh. No siree. Not for him. 
His son Isaac is getting married. He gets married about the same time as his mother Sarah passes away. And so Abraham has, has that to deal with. You can see that at the, at the end of chapter 23 of the book of Genesis. So maybe Isaac, maybe Abraham should be thinking about being a grandpa after all. Isaac's going to have a couple of boys coming along. God has promised Abraham, you're going to be a great nation. Abraham should anticipate grandchildren. After all, what do grandparents do, Julie? They, they spoil the kids, they feed them sugar, and they send them home to mom and dad because grandparents are too old to chase after them. But they sure do love spoiling. I think you've got a plaque that says, I can at Grandma's house. And, and so, you know, maybe that should be Abraham's philosophy. Ah, it's time for me to be Grandpa. I can spoil the boys and send them home. But I want you to open your Bibles, Genesis chapter 24. We're going to be reading a good bit here in the next few minutes from Genesis chapter 25, sorry, not 24. I want you to do something. There's a few points about Abraham that, that had kind of escaped my notice in previous studies. I kind of tended to skim over the first eight verses of chapter 25. I'd come to verse eight and I'd say, Abraham gave up the ghost. Okay, end of Abraham. But in, the, in those eight verses... There's a few points that I want us to specifically notice about Abraham and the way he left this life. 137 years old, remember, when, when Sarah dies. Abraham gets remarried. Genesis chapter 25, verse 1. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Ketra. Now, you don't find Ketra mentioned too many places in the scriptures. I believe there's a passage in 1 Chronicles that talks about Ketra in a, in a different context from this. But she's mentioned only there as far as I'm aware of. But nevertheless, Abraham is no spring chicken. And yet, he takes a walk. Now, we might think, well, this is, this is a wife that that is just going to be a companion in his old age and give him someone to sit by the fireside and talk to. Well, you'll notice what? Following verse. Genesis 25, verse 2. And she bare him Zimron and Joksham and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shushan. Whoo! I'm telling you what now, this guy's going to have to have some energy. There's a couple things that come to mind. Abraham starts completely over. Drop down with me, verse 5. You'll notice something here in verse 5 that I want to point out right now. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Now, I don't think there's going to be a lot of us that would say, we're going to give everything we've got to our kids right now and then start over with another family because that's exactly what he did. Abraham gave what he had to Isaac and then he had six more boys. Now, I've done the math. You don't need to worry about the math. It's accurate. That's 54 months of caring for a pregnant wife. I've had seven children. I've been there. And there's no way that I would want to do it at that age. I don't care how young your wife is. I don't care what, what anyone might think. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of hormones, a lot of emotions. And I know a lot of you ladies tonight have forgot what that might feel like. But I suspect it wouldn't take long to bring it back to memory. And so... Yes, maybe Ketra is of childbearing years, but Abraham is way past it. And yet, Abraham lives life to the fullest. He has six boys. Six boys. It's incredible. It's an incredible life that he lives when he's at the end. 
You know, Abraham also, not only, not only did he give what he had to Isaac, but he also provides a start for this next generation. Look with me. Notice, if you will, Genesis 25, 5. It says, um, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. He starts from scratch. He provides Isaac. There's a concept to be grasped here. If you're a parent, you want your children to have a start in life. I want my children to have a start in life. Although I'm not sure I'm willing to go to Abraham's length yet. But Abraham did. I also want you to notice a, a New Testament parallel passage that really the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is really talking about something that is a different topic altogether, but he brings up the principle here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I really want you to notice the last part of verse 14, but I'll read the full verse. Paul says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome unto you, for I seek not yours but you. Paul says, I am not coming to you to take your treasure. I'm not coming to you to seek what you might have. Paul says, I seek you. And then in the last part of this verse, he likens himself to a parent. To these Christians at Corinth, he likens himself as a parent. He says, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And so Paul draws a, a, a parallel between the very physical element of parents setting aside for their children's well-being to him as a preacher of the gospel setting aside for his children in the spiritual sense, their well-being. And so there is a concept that Paul is using, and I think it's a biblical concept that we as parents should set aside for our children. Abraham does exactly that. You will notice this is not a will. <coughs> Abraham does his giving while he's living. He is not dead. He's not yet really even all that close to being dead. Hebrews chapter 9. The Hebrew writer describes for us in the light of what God would understand to be a will and testament. Hebrews chapter 9 is talking about the, the, the new covenant, the new will and testament of Jesus Christ. I'll read a few passages here, so or a few verses, just so we can understand, make sure we're on the same page, that Abraham is not dead. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 says... For this cause, he that is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death of redemption, speaking of Jesus Christ, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For, notice verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. We'll stop there. You can read more in the context of that as the Hebrew writer intended it. But understand, Abraham is still alive and well, living life to the fullest. He gives what he has to, to Isaac, and then he starts over. He has six more sons, and he even gives them a start in life. We'll see that in a moment. My question to you is, do you have a will? You know, my wife's brother was going to Chile uh, about a year ago, in fact. We got a phone call one day, and he said, hey, we're going to make out a will before we leave. It's not something young people think about a lot. Abe, hey, maybe you'd better think about it, okay? Because we never know what's going to happen. And so as they're preparing for this missionary trip to Chile, as, as Matt and Jessica are getting ready to leave, we get the phone call. And uh, Matt's like, hey, we're getting ready to write out our will, and we'd like to leave you our seven kids. And I'm thinking, whoop, no way. 
No way. You know, I can do math. Seven plus seven is 14. I am not the person that needs to be responsible for 14 kids. That would be 14 children under, let's see, what, the age of uh, four, 15? 15 and under, 14 kids? Oh, no, not for me. But what did I do? I said, well, sure. And then I'm praying, dear Lord, please don't let anything happen. <laughs> you know, it would be bad enough to lose a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law, but man, to have 14 kids, I don't know. <laughs> and so we redoubled our prayer efforts for that missionary trip, and it worked. They're back safe and sound, and, and they're taking care of their seven, and I'm taking care of mine. Consequently, both our wives are working on number eight. So, and, and Abraham closes out. You'll see this down in verse eight. Abraham closes out his life in Genesis chapter 25 in verse eight. And, and I want you to notice what God says about his servant Abraham. He says, then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in good old age, and an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Yeah, at 175, I'd say that's a good old age. I don't reckon I'm going to get anywhere close. Full of years? Absolutely. His life was full. His years were full. He lived life to the fullest he lived it for God. He followed God. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11 reckons him as a man of faith. And yet we also see that he's a man who lives life not only for God, but for those around him. You'll notice I mentioned that he set his children up. And I, I, I forgot, to, forgot to insert that passage, but you'll notice... In verse 6, but the sons of the concubine, that's the second wife, they're referring to her here in verse 6 as a concubine, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from his son, Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And so these six children, he didn't leave them destitute. He didn't leave them out of his life with not a thing. He gave them gifts, set them up in life, and sent them off towards the east. What a life. What a life lived. What a way to live and what a way to go. There's a couple of verses that I want you to consider tonight as we bring the lesson to a close. The first one comes from Romans chapter 14. As the Apostle Paul is reminding the Christians at Rome, in Romans 14, verses 7 and 8, Paul reminds us the importance to live for God. God should be our focus, young or old. Whether we want to live life or not, Paul says this, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Remember that, my friends. If you're breathing, if your breath is coming in and going out, and you have life in your body, we are to live that for the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Friends, sometimes it's in death that our greatest accomplishments and be made for those around us. And so Paul says, whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. And as Paul himself is about to depart from this life, to go to be with the Father, Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 as well. Paul makes his closing out of this letter to Timothy by saying, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Could we say that? 
if we knew that our time was come, now Paul was a fraction. He was probably well, well under 100 years younger than Abraham. Somewhere around 60 years old, give or take a few years, what scholars believe the Apostle Paul was when he died. But no matter what our age, can we say that we are ready? Can we say that we have fought a good fight? Can we say that we have kept the faith? Paul says in verse 8, henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Could we say that? Is that something that you and I could say? Maybe you're not a child of God. Set your life in order. Be able to say it tonight. Hear the word of God. It's available in print form. It's available in audio. It's available any way you want it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Believe in that word and the truth that it represents. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Be buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. And live faithfully.